I love how the Holy Spirit uh, works because uh, Principal Jackson talked about Moses um, and my socks this morning is actually Moses parting the Red Sea. I don't know if you can't really see them, but my socks have Moses on them parting the Red Sea. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then just hearing his, his children's story kind of very much connects with, with the sermon this morning. I, I think... Now, don't quote me. On, actually, no, quote me on this. I think God is trying to tell us something uh, this morning. And I'm sorry, I never do this. I'm going to take my phone out and put it in the other pocket because it's bothering me in this pocket. There we go. As humans, as human beings, um, we need certain things uh, to live, right? Um, we need air, water, sleep. These are some of the basic things that we as, as living creatures, as humans, need to actually to survive. If you cut one of these out, we're going to kind of cut our life kind of short, right? Uh, you, you need sleep. You know, um, I, I've spent sleepless nights doing, when I was in school, I would spend sleepless nights doing homework, writing papers, um, researching, doing all of that. As a, when you work, you kind of, depending on the job that you do, you have some sleepless nights. But if you go so long without sleeping, your body starts to what? Kind of shut down, right? If you cut water out, your body's going to start shutting down. If you take food out, how are you going to have the energy to kind of keep on, uh, on going? So there's different things in life that we need in order to survive. But those are different than our wants, right? There are things we need, then there's things that we want. For example, I can, uh, when, I, when I think of something that I, I, I'm looking for, if I'm going to the store and I'm buying something, I begin to ask myself, I need this. But then I say, oh, wait, hold on. Do I really need it or do I want it? For example, I need, it would help if I turn this on. For example, I need Legos. <laughs> I need Legos. You know, but then I have to take a step back and being like, now hold on. Do I need Legos or do I want Legos? Two totally different things. Now, to be honest, I can make an argument for this statement, I need Legos. And let me tell you, once I make that argument, I will win that argument. I have facts. I have statistics. I have all of these things backing up why I need Legos. Not the point I'm trying to make today, but I need Legos. But then I have to ask myself seriously, do I, am I going to spend the crazy amount of money that Legos now cost? Do I need it or do I want? We as humans, there are things we need but there are things that we want. We need certain things. And, it, and the list can go on of all of these things that we need just to survive. There's one thing that we all need. And, and some may say, I don't need this to survive. I don't need this to move on or to do anything. I beg to differ. I think we need this component that we're going to discuss this morning. Y'all have heard me talk about my, my gym experience um, and how I go to the gym to try to exercise, uh, key word being try uh, to exercise, because it's really difficult. Like, oh my word, I'm just kicking myself every day I go to the gym. I'm just like, why am I here? Uh, this is just torture to put myself through. Uh, but you've all heard me talk about, about my trainer. A and so the thing about my trainer is he is there for me. And you may say, well, duh, he's there for you. You're paying for him. So he's going to be there for you. But it's a little bit different with my trainer because during the week, he'll actually text me and he'll be like, hey, how are you doing today? How was your exercise? How was your training? How's your sleep going? How's your, your diet going? Let's talk about what's going on in your life that's impacting your ability to exercise and to get a better life. What's going on? So I, I, my trainer is one who actually uh, is there and he cares for me and he wants me to reach the goals that I have set for myself. But as I'm exercising, my trainer and I, we actually just changed my, my exercise program. And when I look 
at what I'm doing uh, during the week. I just really hate myself because I signed up for this. Uh, but I go to the gym and I begin to do my workout. And when I'm with my trainer, there are some days, most of the days, I should say, that I just want to plop on the floor and say, I am done. I did that once. <laughs> I plopped right there in the middle of the gym floor and I said, no more. Leave me here. Go without me. Let me die. I'm ready to see Jesus. Just, I'm done. I had nothing left to give. But my trainer did something. My trainer didn't stand over me and said, hey, you got to get up. Come on, time to get up. My trainer got on the floor with me. He got to my level where I was, and he looked at me, and he said, hey, you got this. You can do it. You still have the strength to finish this set. You have energy. It's there. Come on. Get up. Keep doing it. So I, got, I gathered the strength that I had. I got up and I started doing the exercise. And he said, one more. So I did that one more. And he said, you have one more. I said, you said that one more ago. I got nothing. And as soon as I said that, another trainer came running over. And he said, JJ, you got this. So I had two people on either side of me cheering me on, telling me, hey, you have the energy, you have this goal, you can do it, don't give up. This is something that you can do. These two trainers became my support system. And if it weren't for their support, I would have just gone, grabbed my stuff, and walked out the gym without finishing my exercise. But because of the support that my trainer gave me, I was able to finish and feel accomplished. Support. As I said, many can argue that support is something that they don't need to do whatever they're doing in their lives. But I beg to differ. I do think we need support in our lives to truly finish and move on and continue going on in life. Support matters. And scripture tells us, especially if you look in the writings of Paul, Paul tells us so many different ways of ways that we can support our fellow man by praying with them, by, by uplifting them. And if you get to the gospels, there's a story there that I want us to focus on. So if you'll turn with me to the book of Mark, as it was read beautifully earlier, uh, Mark chapter 2 is where we're going to uh, spend our, our time together. Now the three gospels, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, tell this story. Uh, however, Mark kind of adds a little bit more detail that's very important to understand in our story. So Mark chapter 2, it's going to be on the screen as always, but I, I encourage each and every one of you to open scripture and read it for yourself. You got to see God's word uh, for yourself. You have to feel it um, as well. But Matthew or Mark, excuse me, chapter 2, and we're going to begin in verse 1. And this is what he says, and again he entered Capernaum after some days. And it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. So this happened a lot with Jesus. You have heard me say it before. Jesus was kind of like the celebrity of his day, right? Wherever Jesus went, people followed him. And if they didn't follow him there, wherever there was word of Jesus, people in that surrounding area just kind of flocked to Jesus because he was a celebrity. People wanted to see him. People wanted to hear uh, him preach. And in California, this is actually kind of a, a big, huge thing, especially in the LA area. When you go out, you're, expe you're expecting to see a celebrity, right? And whenever you see a celebrity, who's usually right behind them? The paparazzi, right? With their cameras flashing or fans running after them, recording, uh, trying to talk to these celebrities. And, and it's interesting because I actually witnessed this and I was actually a part of this once uh, uh, in California. As you all know, my family and I, uh, well, not really so much me, but my family, uh, we're big Dodger fans. Uh, so they like to watch it on, on TV whenever it comes, a game comes on. Me, not so much. If you tell me, hey, let's go to the stadium, I'm down. Let's go to a Dodger game at the stadium. That's just so much fun rather than just sitting at home watching it. Uh, so we went to a game once 
my family and I, and um, I think every stadium has this, I'm not sure, um, but I know the Dodger Stadium, they have a Dodger store where they sell merchandise from the Dodgers at the very top of their stadium. And so my dad's like, hey, I'm going to go get some stuff. So I said, dad, I'll go with you. And I was, I was a lot smaller, I was a kid. So I went with my dad, we went to the store, got our merchandise, um, got everything we needed, and we began to go back to our seats. Now, if you've ever been to the Dodger Stadium, you have to take escalator after escalator after escalator just to keep going all the way to the top. So we had to take several back down. I get to one escalator to go start going down, and I hear this commotion happening behind me. And I'm just like, I, I ignore it. I'm a kid. You know, what am I going to do? I don't know. Well, so I just ignore the commotion. And I begin to go down the escalator. As I'm coming down the escalator, all I see are these flashes of light just at me. Now, if that were me today, I definitely would have struck some poses. I've been like, hey, look, people know a celebrity when they see one. I can't help it. Uh, but as a child, I didn't know what was going on, right? So I just see these flashes of light, and I'm just like, what in the world is going on? Until I hear my dad's voice behind me, and he says, oh my goodness, sir, please go ahead of me on this escalator. And so I'm just like, what is my dad doing? So I turn around and I, and I look and there's this old, ma old, older, older, old, whatever, older man, older gentleman standing between my father and I. And my dad looks at me and he has the biggest smile on his face. And he said, mijo, do you know who this is? And I look at him and I'm just like, um an old man? <laughs> I, I don't know who this is. He then says, again with this big smile, he says, this is Tommy Lasorda. And so for those of you who don't know who Tommy Lasorda is, he was a pitcher for the Dodgers and another team, but he managed the Dodgers for many years. Um, and and uh, he was inducted into the Hall of Fame because of the Dodgers. Um, and so he was standing right behind me. And as he lifts his hand, I see this big championship ring. I mean, that thing was so huge. Like, you think your engagement ring is huge? This guy's ring was huge. And he lifts it, and he just comes toward my face, and he just goes, what's up, slugger? And I just look at him, and I'm just like, ouch. You know, and again, people are just uh, taking pictures. People are rushing to get to him. And he finally walks off the escalator. And my dad looks at me and he says, you are never washing that side of your cheek again. <laughs> I washed it, so don't worry, it's clean. Uh, but celebrities, I saw how crazy my dad went for this, for this celebrity, Tommy Lasorda, such a legend, someone who you want to meet. And that's the same way it was with Jesus. When scripture tells us that the house was, um, was no, there was no longer room to receive them, we're talking about people just flocking to Jesus. And I'm pretty sure if, if social media existed back then, I'm pretty sure if, if someone tweeted about, hey, Jesus is at so-and-so house, let me tell you how many times that would have been retweeted. Instagram, Facebook, that's how people knew Jesus is here. And this is important for us to understand that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. It's so important for our story to understand that there was no room to get to Jesus. Let's continue reading verse 3. They came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Mark is the only one of the three Gospels who tell us that four men are carrying this paralytic. If you look at Matthew and Luke, it actually just says men. So it doesn't give us a full lot of details. Mark, however, says, no, it's not just any men. There's four men. And there's a specific reason it says four men. Because if you look at what theologians have, have said about this story, they actually very much believe that these four men actually are friends of this paralytic. So Mark is, just, is saying it's not just any men. 
But this man has four friends who brought him, who were carrying him. So this is the second important part. The first one was there was no room in the house. People could not get in there. That's important fact number one. Important fact number two is that this paralytic was carried by four by four men. But as I was studying this, this verse, this, this chapter, this, this story, I, I asked myself a question. I said, well, why are they carrying him? And the answer would be, well, duh, Pastor JJ, he's a paralytic. He can't walk. And boo. Right? But yes, you're correct. He can't walk. But it goes a lot deeper than that. The reason these four friends of this paralytic are carrying him is because this paralytic had lost all hope of recovery. His disease was the result of life of sin and his sufferings were embittered by remorse. He had long before appealed to the Pharisees and doctors hoping for a cure from mental suffering and physical pain, but they coldly pronounced him incurable and abandoned him to the wrath of God. So again, we have to remember the Pharisees taught if you came born with a defect or if you got a disease, you were that, that way because you sinned or your parents sinned. And so God is saying, hey, because you sinned, I'm going to unleash my wrath on you. So this paralytic very much has lost all hope because he is a paralytic. Now, it's not that he just has one lame leg or, you know, his arm or his hand. No, he couldn't move at all. So in his mind, he's thinking, well, I must have sinned so bad that God had just abandoned me, has left me, and now I am dealing with the wrath of God. Have you ever felt like God has abandoned you? Have you ever been in the shoes of the paralytic? And I don't mean that literally. I mean, have you ever been in a spot in your life where you just began to lose that hope? that hope that, that there is no recovery for whatever it is that you are going on in your life. Have you ever been there? Church, I could tell you so many stories of my life where I have began to lose hope. I have began to think to myself, I'm not curable. I should just give up. Have you ever found yourself in that place? This paralytic had lost all hope. But when hope is lost, that's what I love about Scripture, because when hope is lost, Scripture comes back with says, no, it's not. Here's some hope. And we're going to get into that hope because as, as this paralytic was laying there and he was just saying, guys, I'm done. I have nothing to live for. Just let me here to die. I'm, I just lost all hope. His friends came to him and said, hey, have you heard of Jesus? Have you heard of this Jesus? He does such amazing things. He heals people. Uh, if you read the chapter or the verses right before our verses, the end of chapter one, Jesus heals a leper. So he, his friends are saying, have you heard of Jesus? Maybe if you go to Jesus, maybe he can heal you too. The friends repeated this to him. His friends were the ones who were encouraging him and saying, hey, don't give up. Don't lose hope because there's a man named Jesus who does such awesome things. He can do the same for you. But you can't lose hope. Hope, but again, his hope fell when he remembered how the disease had been brought upon him. Remember, because he sinned in life, he fears that the pure physician would not tolerate him in his presence. That cuts deep. Have you ever felt that whatever you are going, whatever is going on in your life has, has separated you from God to the point where you say, listen, Jesus doesn't want me in his presence. This, this disease that I have, this thing that I'm struggling with, Jesus doesn't want to see that. Have you ever found yourself saying those things to yourself? That Jesus just doesn't want me 
in his presence, did you ever feel that you were not worthy enough? Like you weren't good enough? Again, I could tell you multiple stories of my life where I have felt like that. But here's the thing about this paralytic. It wasn't just physical. It was not physical restoration that he desired so much as the relief from the burden of sin. The cry of this dying man was, Oh, that I may come into the presence of Jesus. Church, this paralytic who could have wished for anything, who could have wished to be healed, to be able to walk, to be able to to jump, to run, to swim, to do whatever it is he wanted to do. He could have wished for that, but his dying wish was just to come to the presence of Jesus. So what happens next in the story? So he, he calls to his friends. He says, hey, I believe this hope you're telling me. I have a little bit of faith. Can you take me to Jesus? And did his friends say, no, you know what? I don't have time right now. You know, I got this baseball game that's going on. You know, um, the Dodgers are playing the San Francisco Giants and the Dodgers are going to win. So I kind of have to see that, right? <laughs> you know, did they say that? No. What did his friends say? They jumped at that opportunity. They jumped at that opportunity, grabbed his bed and said, hey, let's go to Jesus. My friend wants to be in the presence of Jesus. Who am I to stop that? So they grabbed his bed. They could have left him there, but they grabbed his bed and they carried him to where Jesus was in verse four. And they could not come near him because of the crowd. So they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying again and again. The bearers of the paralytic tried to push their way through the crowd, but they couldn't in vain. But they could have stopped church family. Let me tell you that. These friends could have said, hey, I can't, we can't get you to Jesus. I'm sorry, man. Maybe the next time he's in town, we can come back and hopefully you can see Jesus. They could have said that, but what does scripture say they do? They went to the roof. His friends took him to the roof and scripture says they broke through. Now, when you look at the Greek, that's why I love the old languages, the original languages, because it's so much richer. It's so much more beautiful. When you look at this part in the Greek, when it says they have broken through, they are meaning they broke that roof apart. Because they said nothing is going to stand in our way to bring our friend to the feet of Jesus. So they broke through that roof. They tore that roof up and they began to lower their friend to the feet of Jesus. These friends went the extra mile. They brought him to Jesus. Have you ever brought someone who is struggling to the feet of Jesus? Or maybe have you done the opposite and pushed them away from Jesus? This is why I say repeatedly, we need to be careful with what we say. We need to be careful with what we do because our actions, our words have consequences. It is not our job to push people away from the presence of Jesus Christ. It is our job to bring them. It does not matter how broken that person is because someone needs to look in the mirror because we are all broken. We all need to be in the presence of Jesus. So again, have you ever brought someone who was struggling to the presence of Jesus? There are many people in our community who are just wanting, I'm sure they have a lot going on in their life, but the thing they want most is to be in the presence of Jesus. Can I bring it closer to home? There are people in our own church who wants to be in the presence of Jesus. Are you bringing them to Jesus or are you pushing them away from Jesus? This is why we need to be careful how we speak to each other. Because the moment the words leave your mouth, I am sorry, friend, there is no taking that back. 
Oh, I didn't mean it. Oh, it was just a joke. No, but you said it. The moment it leaves, it can never come back. And whatever we say, unfortunately, instead of bringing people to Jesus, we're actually pushing them away. We need to be like these these friends who went the extra mile and tried to push through the crowd but couldn't get in. So they said, hey, we have an idea. Let's go to the roof. Let's tear this thing apart so we can bring our friend before Jesus Christ. Our last verse. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. When Jesus saw their faith. Church, sometimes your faith is going to be rocky, and that's okay. Sometimes your faith, you're going to start questioning your own faith, and that's okay. That's why we need to look out for each other. That's why when we see that someone is struggling with life, struggling with their faith, struggling with their belief in God, struggling with whatever it is that they are struggling with, that's why it is our job to look out for each other. And when that person is struggling, we need to grab them by the hand and say, hey, you need to come to Jesus. And when they say, no, I can't go, I can't be in his presence, we have to just say, you know what, that's baloney. Because scripture says Jesus wants you in his presence. We need to bring people before Jesus. There was a time in my life when I lost all hope. Where I felt like this paralytic. Where I felt like God just abandoned me. And I felt that I could not stand in the presence of Jesus no longer because of how ugly I looked on the inside. But let me tell you something. God blessed me with amazing friends because my friends held me up and they said, stop it. Let's go to Jesus. And my friends are the reason I am standing before you. It wasn't because I found the strength. It wasn't because of my faith. It was because of the strength and faith of my friends that brought me before the Lord once again. When Jesus saw their faith, when Jesus sees your faith, he can bless the person you're bringing. Because when you bring that person before Jesus Christ, when you lay them at the feet of Jesus, he blesses them, and in return, it blesses you. Scripture gives us so many different ways to help our fellow men, but I think this is one of the greatest ways to bring people before Jesus. We need to be these friends and bring people Because let me tell you, church, there's going to be a time where our faith is going to be tested. There is going to be a time where we are going to want to question God. And if I can be so bold to say that that time is now, we need to gear up. We need to put aside all of our differences and focus on bringing each other before the throne of grace because that is what's going to give us the energy to move on. But we have to support each other. We cannot do it on our own. We need to be these four friends and bring people before the throne of God. And we need to do everything and anything that we can to make sure that our friend gets to see the presence of Jesus. Because when we do, as I said, it blesses them. They get a blessing of being in the presence of Jesus. But Jesus says, hey, you deserve a blessing too. And in return, we get blessed. That's why our closing hymn says, there shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. 
There shall be seasons refreshing sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drop round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. We need the blessing of Jesus Christ. And what better way to receive that blessing when we bring each other with us? What better way to receive the blessing of Jesus than grabbing hands, holding hands, and walking together through struggles, through obstacles, through pain, through happy times? What better way to receive the blessing of Jesus than with family? So this morning, church family, my question for you is, will you be the hands of support? for these showers of blessing. But Father, may we not partake in these showers of blessing on our own. May we grab each other's hand. May we walk together as we receive these blessings as a church family. Give us that strength, O oh Lord, to be like these four, uh, these four friends who did everything they could to make sure that their one friend was at the feet of Jesus. May we bring each other before your throne of grace. And as we depart today, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone.